middle of October. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It is Thursday, so you get to hear me talk for a little bit about immigration. Okay, what are we going to talk about today? What's in the news? First things first. Um, so, um, starting in November, the border crossings between Mexico um, and U.S. and U.S. and Canada are going to reopen for non-essential travel. So essentially what's been happening until now is that if you had to cross the border and that assumes obviously with a valid visa or a passport, not, I'm not talking about border crossings where um, it's uh, through, other than through a port of entry, undocumented border crossings, right? So up until now, you had to have an essential purpose in crossing the border, right? Or you had to have some sort of a waiver and stuff like that. You can still fl fly in and out of the countries and, you know, tourism was open and people did fly to and from Mexico. But um, since uh, March of 2020, the border crossings for non-essential purposes were closed. So the Biden administration has come out and said that for all vaccinated individuals, the border crossing will reopen in November which, you know, is going to be good for commerce. Um, commerce was really actually essential, most of it. But um, people are going to be able to drive, you know, visit their families, tourism and stuff like that. It is another notch in the easement of restrictions, which is always um, a good, good thing, right? I will remind you that starting November, um, vaccinated travelers to uh, United States from Europe, from the countries that were banned since March of 2020, will resume. You're going to have to show proof of vaccination. That's a, also great, right? Is, um, there wasn't a reciprocity because Europe reopened its borders to U uh, American citizens at the end of the summer, but we were very slow to reciprocate. But now that the situation is getting under control and the amount of cases are steadily declining, you know, the um, administration made, in my opinion, the right move in reopening and eliminating these restrictions. Uh, for those of you who are from Europe um, and some other countries, you might be familiar with something that's called ESTA. It's a visa waiver program. There are There's a treaty basically between United States and a number of countries, most of European countries, that allows for their citizens to apply for what's called a visa waiver program. They can come to United States for 90 days, stay here. They can't work, but just for visit purposes, and they do not have to actually apply and go to the embassy every single time, right? It's a type of a program where a traveler can come without a visa. Now, on the reciprocal side of it, U.S. citizens have been um, historically able to go to Europe and the Schengen area for 90 days. Uh, we didn't need to have any paperwork done except booking a flight and going. That is uh, slated to change in 2023. Europe Schengen era area is going to Schengen zone is going to impose reciprocity schedule on us so we're going to have to apply for a program that is similar to what they have to apply to come here um, so if you're you're a citizen you're no longer going to be able to just book a flight and go there's going to be um, a little bit of paperwork involved but that's not coming for another two years we will talk about that. Um, what's big? What's big? So announcement that is big is the following. Um, ICE um, has, especially under the previous administration, um, been heavy on the arrests at workplaces, right? So let's say you are a restaurant and they know that there are undocumented immigrants that are employed at the restaurant. They would sort of speak, raid the place, arrest um, the undocumented individuals. And then from there, you know, they will be detained and then each one would have a process. Some of them would be able to get out. Some of them would be deported. Um, it would be all, um, 
a whole thing, right? But each would could have its own individual case and then each would either hire an attorney or maybe already had an attorney or were already in process of doing documents. Um, now the priorities are going to shift. They're saying we want to shift from enforcing against employees to enforcement against employers. So they're going to say like, we want to now go after the people who are employing people who have no documents, right? So if you can capture 10 individuals who are undocumented working in a given establishment, or you can go after 10 employers who each employ 10 individuals, that's already 100 people, so I kind of understand the rationale. Um, it is also like backing away from putting the entire burden on the undocumented employee and holding, holding essentially in theory responsible the employer who is not complying with the US immigration laws also accountable, right? It's a philosophical debate whatever you can agree or disagree with it you can talk about it you can ask questions about it i'm just reporting the facts so um that's one number two is that the statute the the crime statute is going to be expanded to include blackmailing based on immigration status so essentially if you're being blackmailed because you because of your immigration status and that could be you know employer individual spouse whatever the case may be that is going to actually become uh, a part of a definition of a crime and you the person doing it can now um, get arrested for that and face consequences which again um, I'm not taking a stand why we're way, one way or another, there's always complexity to every single case. Um, and we have seen so many across the borders, unfortunately, um, that, you know, could go either way. But that, that's how it's going to be. Another thing is you have to understand, um, and that goes kind of to FLSA laws, which is guides employment um, laws in the United States. For example, um, if an employer is employing an undocumented immigrant, right, and they know it, um, and there's a violation, the person can be slapped with, and let's say they're working 60 hours a, a week, but they're getting paid $400, and the employer is not paying them more because they know their immigration status, and they know they have nowhere to go, they don't have employment, work employment, and so on and so forth. You have to understand that you can go after the employer for your wages. If you sue the employer for underpaying your wages, um, the employer cannot fire you. You can keep your job, get paid more, and the person, the employer, cannot retaliate against you by firing you, right? So I happen to work with a lot of people in service industries, people who work as, you know, people who work as nannies, people who work as caretakers, delivery people, uh, you know, bus boys, waiters, and so on and so forth, construction, who are severely underpaid. And the major fear of the people is if, if I complain, I will lose my job. That is actually not true. If you sue your employer under FLSA, it's a strict liability statute, you will get to keep your job. The employer cannot fire you. That would be retaliation. So, and now basically they're saying that the person can also be hit with a smuggling um, or uh, sorry, not smuggling, um, human trafficking violations, right? Because you are knowingly exploiting a person without documents so that it becomes a very complicated legal situation. And it looks like the um, federal government wants to protect people in that situation and the people who have come out of that situation may in the future be able to actually apply for some, some sort of relief from deportation from the United States. It's all very complicated, um, 
but I want to tell you that we do handle those types of cases and if you have any issues with um, your employer if you think you're underpaid if you think you are treated differently because of your employment status um, if you are penalized financially for things that you think you should not be penalized for if there's any type of financial manipulations that are going on and you know you feel defenseless because you don't have status in the United States please know there is a way forward um, and there's a way forward without you actually losing your job come talk to us about it it's very important um, and a lot of the times we can help right a lot of the times we can help every single case um, requires an individual conversation, individual questions, and you know, never compare yourself to somebody else because people will come to me and say, oh, I was referred to you by such and such, you did their case, we're like, we're very happy, thank you very much for the referral, but your case is substantially different, it has different fact patterns, therefore it requires different work, different processing times, and so on and so forth. So this is very, very interesting, okay? Um, another thing that has been a shift in priorities is that under the previous administration, um, let's say you have gone through the immigration process and you had a deportation order, and then let's say you got married to your citizen and you're ready to fix your immigration situation. One of the things that is required before we can deal with your deportation order is an interview at the offices of USCIS where you and your spouse would be interviewed together. So under Obama, um, it was safe to go for an interview with a deportation order and the officer would only concentrate on your marriage or let's say if a child is applying for you, only concentrate on that family relationship. Under Trump, the priorities have shifted, and if a person walked in in an interview with a deportation order, most of the time they would have been detained, you know, and then the process would have to happen, you know, while being detained if they were not released on bond, um, if there were other considerations, and so on and so forth. Now we're back. Right, so we've had people go into interviews with the active deportation orders, do the family interview, be successful at it, and then move on to the next step, which is dealing with the deportation without the consequences of actually being uh, detained. Again, I have to say it's a case by case basis, even though their priorities are not to detain right now. Uh, it also depends criminal background history the officer like things can really shift so if, if you have a deportation order and you have an interview that have to go to USCIS you should talk to an immigration attorney to see what the options are the documents you should be coming with and the things you should really be prepared for when you go in there um, a lot of embassies remain closed unfortunately we are getting interviews a lot of the uh, like Ecuador is definitely having um, uh, it's definitely processing cases um, a lot of Caribbean countries are processing cases um, we haven't heard anything from Jamaica but a lot of Latin American countries are processing cases um, we had some successes in Eastern Europe outside of the Schengen area that were pretty um, successful and uh, we've seen a phenomenon where an embassy will open up for a few weeks and then close down and then we have to shift to a different embassy that has been quite hard um, but they are a lot of them are remain closed and even if you want to check it out, the best place to start is just to go to the embassy's website. And a lot of the times at the very top, it'll say, embassy is only processing such cases, not processing such cases, limited in its capacity. All embassies have emails and phone numbers that you can certainly reach out to. Um, and some of them do not even respond right now to emails. Um, so uh, that remains an area that um, we're looking for improvement on and I'm hoping after New Year's um, 
we will hear some good news on that okay as of right now immigration court is operational cases are moving forward some of them of course do get rescheduled and stuff like that but the cases are moving forward hearings are happening uscis is at full force they are interviewing green cards they're doing naturalization applications and they're full force interviewing right and we've actually seen a slow down and uh, slow down and speeding up in uh, processing time and shortening of the processing time so some of our clients were pleasantly and unpleasantly surprised we've had cases that were filed this year and people already got green cards this year we've had um, multiple cases like that um, but uh, the processing times have remained um, longer than historical right if you take let's say the obama years they were faster then there was a very big slowdown and then we're kind of getting back on track um and stuff like that um so that's all the news for today uh, let me know if you need me to talk about anything interesting anything that's interesting to you next time let me know if you have any questions you can reach out to us here or you know this is going to be uploaded to youtube where you can find things i've talked about before they are segregated by subject so you know you could just read the caption and it'll say what it is that i'm going to be talking about in the specific segment i wish everybody a great end of the week and i hope to see you all back here next thursday thank you and um, have a great day